Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hi, and welcome to Reloscope, the Relationship Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm Marie Stella, your host from Melbourne, Australia. Let's start the show. Welcome back to Reloscope, the Relationship Science Insights Podcast. Now, beyond the initial stages of love and passion lies the realities of daily life as a couple, and sometimes harsh. And we are here today with licensed marriage and family therapist Tessa Sinclair to get her professional expertise on this matter. Hi, Tessa. How are you going today? Hey, Marie. I'm doing great. How are you? Fine, thank you. Um, Now, I was curious to know, when it comes to living arrangements, what's the most common problem your clients bring to you? I think at top of the list would be trouble with chores and communication. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is clients who have already moved in together and they're asking for feedback and support. Mm -hmm. And what kind of effect does it have on the relationship when they struggle with this? Oh, man, if if they're struggling with it and it's not addressed, it can be completely detrimental to the relationship. Um, mm-hmm. on, the, on the other hand, if they talk about the problems, then it can really deepen and um, improve the relationship. So it's all, all how you deal with it. Um, that's a great preface to our topic for today. But before we go further into detail, um, as I'm sure that we will do that, I'd love to get to know you better. This is Have You Met Tessa Sinclair? And the first question I have for you is what do you like to do in your spare time? Uh-huh. Um, spare time. That's a fun one. <laughs> I think I have learned to enjoy the, the small things in life that we all do every day anyway. So a great mm-hmm. example of that is cooking. And in particular, I love to bake. Oh, what do you like to bake? Um, I like to bake cookies and pies and cakes and Mm -hmm. croissants and Mm -hmm. just about anything I have time for. Wow, croissants. Um, How long did it take? (laughs) When did you start learning how to do croissants and how long did it take you? I have a little bit of a professional background in baking that <gasps> precedes my marriage and family therapy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. How long were you learning baking for? Um, that was about 10 years ago. I think I did it for three or four years. But yeah, people, I was taught how to make croissants. That wasn't something I just figured out on my own. That's amazing. And do yeah. you just like doing plain croissants or are there any other types of flavors you like to incorporate? <sighs> Um, I think my favorite are almond croissant and secret about that. Mm -hmm. It's actually a day old fresh croissant that you um, include this almond paste in and put little powdered sugar on top and (sighs) like a brand new treat. Yeah, that sounds incredible. Um, And what do you think are like just the defining factors that make a croissant a good croissant? I guess they would be buttery, flaky, light. There's also this discrepancy between an American croissant and a French croissant. Mm -hmm. So the first bakery I worked at taught me French croissants, which were itty bitty, according Mm -hmm. to this this baker anyway, Mm -hmm. whereas American croissants are, of course, enormous. Mm -hmm. Um, And are there any differences in the consistency and the texture of the croissants or is it just size? I think the bigger ones can be a little bit breadier sometimes. Um, yeah. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, really interesting. Um, what about films and movies and TV shows? Um, do you like watching any of those and what kind of genres do you veer towards? Totally. Um, I think because marriage and family therapy is my profession and often we're dealing with the challenges of being a human being. I like lighter content, um, which that can be a problem with my partner in our living <laughs> arrangement. But uh, a show that I've really been enjoying is Julia on HBO Max. Have you seen that one? No, I haven't. Yeah, Tell it's about, about Julia's child. 
Yeah. Well, I guess I'm on a I'm on a food theme. So yeah, it's Julia Child, and it's how she started her um, her program on public television and became famous. I think in her fifties. Mm -hmm. So is it like based on facts, or as is far it like as I a know, documentary? Yeah. I mean, it's a mini series, so it mm -hmm. plays like that. But I think it's probably factual. Um, okay. Yeah. It's a little twist the way HBO likes to do, but it's it's close enough so you get an idea. That's really interesting. And do you like to travel at all? I do like to travel. Where do you like to travel to? <laughs> uh, well, it's been some years, but I grew up in a traveling family. Uh -huh. um, and in fact, my dad lived in Australia for several years in his 20s. was one of wow. his favorite places. <laughs> um, really interesting. So where were some of your favorite spots? And w w where would you, if you had to pick three, which three would you revisit? Revisit. Um, I loved Hungary. Uh, we went to Budapest and there are all kinds of hot springs there, natural hot springs. Mm -hmm. And that's where some of my um, my lineage is from. Mm -hmm. um, I would probably go back to some of the, um, the national parks here in the United States. They are mm -hmm. absolutely beautiful, um, but sometimes really crowded, which is, is kind of unfortunate. And a third, I would go back to some of the beaches in Mexico and mm -hmm. soak up the sun and relax. Sounds amazing. And I've always wanted to see a national park at, uh, in the United States. Um, and they're large as well, these sweeping. Um, it feels like if I ever go there, I need to spend like a whole year just traveling around the United States or something like that because there's so much to cover. That would be a great trip. You could get a, <laughs> one of those sprinter vans and spend a yeah. whole year and go to all the national parks. I uh, hope you do that. <laughs> I have to learn how to drive first. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. or hire a driver. Right? Hire a driver. <laughs> oh, that's going to that's gonna put a hole in my wallet for sure. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I feel like we got to know you a bit better as a person. Um, now we're moving on to the interview questions. And my first question for you is how would you define a relationship, especially a romantic one? Yeah. So I looked to the internet to help me a little bit with this one because I don't think of a relationship as necessarily being with another person. Mm -hmm. um, you can have a relationship to television or a relationship to marijuana or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the first definition that came up said the way in which two or more concepts, ob objects, or people are connected. Um, or the state of being connected. And when I saw that word, it, it, it just was an aha for me where I think a relationship is a state of being connected, right? And mm -hmm. with romantic relationships, that's especially true. Um, also something that I think will come up as we continue to talk is I think we confuse sometimes connected with closeness. And so sometimes we get a little too up in each other's business thinking that that means we have a better relationship or we spend too much time together because, oh, we're closer. But that's not necessarily a state of being connected in a genuine way. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's really interesting that you distinguish the two. Um, but what do you think makes a romantic relationship? Um, what do you think are the makings of a romantic relationship, a successful one at least? Mm -hmm. Well, that is a really interesting question. I think in today's age with all the new, um, I don't even know if they are new, but with there being more awareness around different types of re romantic relationships, mm -hmm. I think physical intimacy comes to mind as a characteristic, but doesn't have to be there. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I would say intimacy is, is a factor of a romantic relationship and yeah. knowing somebody in a way that you don't know anybody else. It's special to just the two of you, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. And do you think that every romantic relationship has a honeymoon phase? Um, um, yeah. Yeah. Was there more to the question? No, no, no. no. Continue. <laughs> um, do I think every romantic relationship has a honeymoon phase? I guess not. Honestly, I think most do, but I mm -hmm. don't think they have to. Yeah. And what defines a, the honeymoon phase? How long does it usually last? Yeah. Well, the honeymoon phase is typically at the beginning of a relationship when two people are still getting to know each other. 
Um, and I think that part is key because when we don't know each other really well, we can make up stories and fantasies and have ideas about who that person is. So you meet somebody, you're attracted to them, you like them just enough to continue getting to know them. And then in that process, you start to fill in, we start to fill in the blanks with what we like and create this whole story and fantasy. And people go to varying lengths with that, but it can really get projected out. And um, it can make for a really glorious time where everything is super fun and both partners are like, wow, this person is amazing and I'm so happy and so fulfilled. And this just feels like vacation for the rest of my life. Um, and typically there's a point or a, um, a phase where that, that starts to break down a little bit and we get back to reality, as they say. And usually when is that point? I don't know if there is a specific timeline, but um, I've heard one thing that you have a relationship after three hours, three days, three weeks, three months, and three years. And what that's suggesting is that there are different points at, at which we get to know someone better or those levels of fantasy break down a little bit. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Does it ever extend into your living together? The honeymoon? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think moving in together could be kind of a re reuptake or uptake on, um, on the honeymoon. You get like a fresh burst of newness and maybe it would be more accurate to call that nesting, mm -hmm. but it could be a fresh honeymoon. Mm -hmm. And when people decide, when couples decide to live together, what are some of the main reasons for this? Yeah, I think that probably depends as well on age and stage. But at least with the folks I typically work with who are kind of ranging from 20s to 40s, um, it's usually a step in the direction of becoming more serious in the intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. um, of course, people also move in together for financial reasons. It, it costs less. Or say you have couples who are living long distance. They're separate from each other. When they eventually end up in the same city, what I've seen is that people tend to move into the same occupancy. They're not going to just take up two separate residences in, yep. in the same place. It can be kind of a logical step in that way. Mm -hmm. And apart from feeling satisfaction in the relationship and of course, financial ease, what are some of the benefits for couples when it comes to living together? Um, what in the relationship would benefit from this? Yeah. Um, I think probably the number one benefit is getting to know each other in a more real and true way. Mm -hmm. um, I like to, you were asking me about traveling. Um, you know, how when you travel with someone, you really get to know them. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how a lot of friendship ends too. Well, totally. And I'm sure we'll get into that with the conversation because I think it's very similar with living together. You move in, suddenly there's nowhere to hide. And you're going to get to know one another really intimately for better or for uh, worse. Yeah. And yeah. in sickness and in health. There uh, you go. <laughs> <laughs> so before taking that step, what do you think couples should consider, especially, especially the factors that you think couples don't consider enough or don't think about enough? Mm -hmm. Um, I think expectations needs to be at the top of that list. And um, I had a mentor who recommended having an expectation conversation. Um, and the idea there is to get conscious about what you're hoping for, looking for and expecting, because um, we kind of assume a lot of times that those things are reasonable or obvious and they're not necessarily. So to, to get clear, not only with our partners, but also with ourselves. Like, oh, this is what I'm, I'm thinking that I'm going to move in with my partner and he'll bring me coffee in bed every day. And then that doesn't happen. And suddenly there's a problem. So what do you think are some of the best practices for couples to do before they consider living together? Not really consider living together, but before they make that decision to live together. Mm -hmm. It's a really good question, Marie. And what I keep thinking is, I don't know that couples are going to do it. It seems like it, <laughs> maybe this goes back to what you were saying about honeymoon. There's sort of this momentum when that decision is on the table. Mm -hmm. I think especially if both people are interested and invested mm -hmm. um, in terms of what to consider, I think, or to look out for. I think sometimes one, one member of the couple might push that decision. 
Um, and that that's something to pay attention to because um, I think balance is really important to a sustainable living situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. for sure. Um, and do you think it's important at all to to wait out the honeymoon phase before actually moving in together? Or do you think living together could potentially, you know, benefit the relationship despite, you know, doing this in the middle of the honeymoon phase? That's a a pretty juicy question. I like that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I do think that there's something to be said for waiting um, for the sobriety of of the post-honeymoon phase, especially because um, when we're in that phase, our our neurology is actually changed. The chemicals in our brains are different when we're freshly in love and everything is geared toward like bond and, you know, reproduce and there's all this, the this, yeah. these things going on. So yeah, there's, there's some wisdom in holding off if you can. Mm-hmm. And is that something that you'd advise many couples or do you think it's like more of a case by case basis? Pretty case by case. The way that I work and the way I orient to these type of things is I'm very, um, responsive to whoever's in the room with me. Like if you came to me and and you asked me this question, I would sort of listen where you're coming from. And just based on the conversation we've just had, Marie, I would say, well, it sounds like you think there might be some value in waiting. Mm. Did I get that right? Yeah, that's (laughs) really interesting. That is really interesting. So it kind of depends on what the individuals in the relationship feel about actually moving in together. So let's say both people are eager to move in together. It's fine to not wait the honeymoon phase out, um, especially if they're only considering that because, you know, they've heard from external, you know, voices and other people that it's something that they should do and they only think they they should do that, do that because other people said so. Totally. Oh, yeah, I that's think really interesting. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, so what are some common problems that you think couples should be aware of before living together? And, um, how do you think they should solve these issues? And then, um, the phrase that immediately came to mind when you asked me that is shared responsibility and that when you're moving in together, you are signing on to share responsibility in one way or another. Um, and so to be as, as conscious and prepared for what that's going to look like as possible and to have conversations about it. And there are also, um, there are tools to help couples with that because it's so universal, especially I mentioned chores at the beginning. Like it's so typical to get frustrated at each other because the dishes are piling up or the trash is too full or, you know, seems trivial, but it's annoying. (laughs) Yeah. And what sort of tools do you think um, couples should look to for guidance on this? There is a book and a deck of cards called Fair Play. Have you ever heard of that? No, I have not. That's okay. really interesting. That, I have it. That's all right. If I scooch and grab this. So, yeah, there's a woman named Eve Rodsky, and she's written a whole book and um, created this deck based on trying to level the the actually the mental load between specifically with heterosexual couples, but within any where they're just couples are sharing um, not only the physical tasks, but the mental load refers to um, what we're holding in our minds and and thinking about. And again, in terms of responsibility, like it's my responsibility to feed the dogs or whatever the thing is, that's a layer of work too. And so the deck of cards helps externalize that. So, um, it's a little less personal for the couple. Oh, that's really interesting. And I imagine that it also helps kind of feed uh, and prompt the couples to, uh, because sometimes in these conversations, um, it's really hard to even think about where to begin or what to say. And it sounds like the deck of cards is a good neutral, um, you know, almost mediator kind of like um you know prompting the couple on like what to consider and what to what 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 they can talk about in a more neutral way rather than like you know charging head first with the emotions and being like i'm angry at you um 
Yeah. So Marie, you're saying that the deck of cards is like having a mediator or an objective person. And that's that's so spot on because that way when something like the dishes, let's say that's always an argument. When that comes up with the cards, it's not like one of you bringing up a hot topic. It's just, whoops, there it is. You know, yeah. sorry, I had nothing to jump to. <laughs> yeah. And like the gamification of it too does make it a bit more interesting and you know instead of like oh this is something that we have to talk about now it's like I'm let's play a game <laughs> <laughs> and who doesn't you like playing it. a game um exactly. so that's really interesting do you have any more like other suggestions for tools like that that are similar at all or um Yes. Okay. I've got props. So have you heard of the feelings wheel? <laughs> oh my God. No, I have not. And that sounds adorable. I love that. Yeah, this is going to be a game changer. Um, so it is a wheel that has on the inside some of the basic emotions like um, happy, fearful, angry, surprise, whatever. Um, and then going out from there, the emotions get much more complex. So in the in the mad category, it'll say furious or irritated or whatever. Um, and this is a way for couples to not only identify their own feelings, but mm -hmm. be able to express those to their partners. And this is huge in improving communication. That's really interesting. And for those who are listening, Tessa just um, held up like this pillow with the feelings wheel on it. Um, but I imagine you could probably find it online and print it out yourself too. Totally. Yep. It is everywhere and it's all over Etsy. Somebody got wise to the idea that this thing is really cool. <laughs> um, so have you used that at all in your practice or in your <laughs> own relationship? Yeah, frequently. People oh. seem to really like it. Uh huh. Yeah. It's, it's like there was an expectation that we're supposed to know how to describe our emotional states and um, it's not that easy. It turns out tools are really helpful. Yeah, completely. And I guess sometimes, you know, um, if especially if you don't think about it or reflect that much on it, um, which, you know, it's not something that they teach you in schools, you know, so not everyone's going to, to have that um, motivation to do it because, you know, it's, it's not something you're taught to be like that this is the next step of life. You've got to figure out your vocabulary and your emotions um, and stuff like that. So it sounds like the feeling wheel really helps with that. Um, now, is this feeling wheel something that you see couples using like for like over a long extended period of time or um, do you see couples like dropping it after like a while because they've kind of learned to to identify the emotions with that? I think that could go either way and probably depends on the couple as well, like how committed they are to really sticking with that. Um, mm -hmm. I guess it's, it's more of something that you start to internalize and you wouldn't need the wheel quite as accessible, right. but right. yeah. 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 You could keep going with it. That's really interesting. Um, so you mentioned before that there's a difference between connectedness and closeness um, was that right? So what habits do you think couples can adopt to maintain that connectedness and to, you know, improve on that while living together? Yeah. So this deserves a nod to Esther Perel, who is a, a, I know you've heard of her and your guests have mentioned her. She's an expert on couples and her groundbreaking work was called Mating in Captivity. Mm -hmm. um, and the concept there was that when we are up close, right in each other's faces when we're on top of each other in our lives, that it kind of kills the spark. Mm -hmm. um, so ironically, one of the, the practices for connectedness is to allow space mm -hmm. um, and intentional space. And uh, I, th I think it requires getting to know your partner in a way that you know what kind of space will really fuel them and revitalize them. So for some of us, that's in the morning. For some of us, that's at night. For some of us, that's with friends or whatever it looks like. It's just having time away from each other. So when you come back, you're refreshed and um, ready to connect again. Right. Distance makes the heart grow fonder. And it is. <laughs> so some claim that couples who live together pre-marriage tend to experience a higher level of marital satisfaction too. Um, is this true? And if so, why? 
Well, I hadn't heard that, but seeing it there, I think if it is true, it would be true because couples who live together get to know each other really well. They iron out some of the kinks and the wrinkles. And then by the time they're ready to get married, they they know what they're getting into. The expectations are clear. Um, right. So in that way, yeah. But yeah. I bet you it, it equally goes the other way. And couples that move in, it ends the relationship. And so, you know. Right. Well, it also sounds like when couples decide to move in together before marriage, um, whatever issues they have to work out rather than like coming in all at once and shocking the couple in the relationship at one like single point in time um it evens out over an extended period of time it starts off like you know they figure out other issues first rather than having all of the issues come in at once if that makes sense yeah, that that sounds kind of like I was describing with the honeymoon period that there are like these different phases of, of yeah. reckoning or seeing mm-hmm. what's what's real. Yeah, so maybe a couple should go on a trip first, oh. then move in together, and then consider marriage Smart, um, so they can yeah. get to know each other. Uh-huh. Yeah, maybe even multiple trips. I wouldn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and throw an international trip in there for sure. That's mm-hmm. another level. um now what is your opinion on the trend of couples living together is this a benefit or a drawback i'm gonna say it's a benefit let's go with benefit especially based on what you were just describing because if couples are waiting to move in together no waiting to get married until they've moved in together what am I trying to say here? I think I think you follow. If there's a holding off on the moving in together before taking a big step, mm-hmm. then how will you know what step you're actually taking? Mm-hmm. And there's no way to kind of fake or replicate living mm-hmm. with another person and seeing how they are in their primary habitat mm-hmm. at all hours of day and night. Mm-hmm. So completely. Yeah. 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 Um, and it probably also is a benefit to the relationship to just get to know what someone's like when things are bad and see how they handle things and whether you know you are compatible in that department to um instead of just you know with the physical intimacy and all of the more i wouldn't want to say shallow but you know more of the in the honeymoon phases um of the relationship kind of intimacy um so yeah thank you so much for sharing that with us are there any other tools or um you know games or resources that you <laughs> recommend to people <laughs> well actually <laughs> I'll, I'll think on that but to to that last point about the benefits yeah. i also want to emphasize that um even if the, that particular relationship doesn't work out or whatever there are challenges that is a huge benefit because there, and you can think of this as a game if you're kind of a personal growth junkie or something <laughs> like being <laughs> in relationship and living together is the best way to challenge mm-hmm. everything in our, mm-hmm. in our selves, right? And to figure out how to show up better and differently. So it's not always about that exact relationship, but um, there's a lot of benefit in yeah. in those opportunities. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And you find out best when you're living together and it's better, even if it ends, it's better that it ends then and you figure yeah, things out is. then rather than later, I suppose. I think so. Mm-hmm. That was really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Now, did you have any more tools or resources that you think would benefit couples who are cohabiting or considering cohabiting? Yeah, and I need to give credit now to uh, my couples counselor, whose name is Rick Hupp, H-U-P-P, because honestly, he gave me the, and and my partner, the feelings wheel, the fair play book, and then this next one that I'm about to share. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is called the feedback wheel. And yes, you can you can Google it. And it's a little bit cumbersome to try to explain. But it, basically what it comes down to is recognizing that whatever perception we have of a situation is only that. It's a perception or it's a story. And so it's a tool to help us express. Um, I would love to have an example here. But to express the way we're interpreting things. So I would say, Marie, when blah, 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 blah happens... I have a story that, and then I tell you what I'm making Mm -hmm. up in my mind. Mm -hmm. I tell you how it makes me feel. 
And then ultimately I say what I'm hoping for or what I want. (laughs) So it leaves the couples with this hopeful or positive note of like, oh, you're not just throwing up on me with your feelings and your criticism. It's like, oh, you actually want us to have a a closer and better relationship or whatever it is. And you're not, yeah. And you're not acting on the emotions that you kind of just made up based on some assumption, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, right. Exactly. Because you're, you're being clear about So let's say you didn't take the trash out. And I say, when you don't take the trash out, I have a story that you don't care about our house being clean and it makes me mad, blah, 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 blah. (laughs) Now my partner has a chance to speak to that and say, of course I care about the house being clean. But if I'm not open about that, then they don't have a chance to to respond. So it just makes everything more transparent. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. And they also don't have a chance to understand why something or like like a responsibility or an action is important to you. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for that. Right. Which makes it more um, meaningful to then fulfill that request because you now know how very important it is to me that the trash is out and you want to make me feel good. And then, you know, we're back in the honeymoon. Yahoo. (laughs) So the feedback wheel, the um, feelings wheel, that all sounds really, really fun. Thank you for sharing that with us. And thank you to the couples counselor who actually um, recommended them to you. Rick Hub, was it? Uh huh. That's thank right. Thank you, Rick. Um, we appreciate yeah. it. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Now we're moving on to the practices and habits section um, mm-hmm. of the episode, and this is more on the practical sides of things. And we'd love to know what is the habit that you recommend practicing to improve yourself in when it comes to navigating, you know, the realities of the of daily life with a partner. Well, we've touched on a few of them already. Um, And I've also alluded to, I think it's different for everybody, right? So just being really open that we have to know ourselves well enough to know our practice. And all that preamble, because it's kind of a cliche, (laughs) I think for myself, sitting down and meditating first thing in the morning, whether it's for five minutes or 20, (laughs) um, can make a complete difference in my whole demeanor for the rest of the day, where I'm calmer, I'm easier to interact with and give and receive feedback with my partner. Um, Yeah. For sure. And um, are there any challenges to implementing this practice of meditating? Oh my God, it's so challenging. And (laughs) I think that's why the first thing in the morning thing is key because um, I had a meditation teacher many years ago recommend that meditation become like brushing your teeth where it's not a conversation like, oh, am I going to do it today? I'm not, I mean, maybe for some people it is, but for most of us, we have a habit of brushing our teeth and that's the end of it. So letting meditation become like that so we don't have excuses um, to avoid it. Mm-hmm. And what qualifies as meditation? Because I am going to assume that 10 minutes of conscious shut eye does not count. <laughs> You mean like getting snooze? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so I think that if you, if you're asleep, that's one thing. But if you're laying in your bed on, say on your back with your eyes closed, conscious shut eye, and you are um, observing your mind and or feeling your body, that absolutely qualifies. Um, Yet another teacher said that she does not get out of bed until she feels gratitude for the day in her body. So she waits until she's thankful that her eyes opened that day and that she woke up. Um, Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting way to approach it too. Um, I've tried meditating myself and I never really, really got anywhere. I think because it was pretty aimless in my, like my approach was pretty aimless and just really sitting there and what, you know, everyone was saying, you just shut your eyes and you just focus on this and that. And if, yeah, personally, it was pretty aimless. So it sounds like a really interesting approach to try it out. Um, but personally, what, how long did it take you to implement meditating? Mm-hmm. Um, for myself, I think I was interested in my early twenties. So we're getting on 20 years now. Um, 
And it's been something that comes and goes. It may be like for others, it might be like an, an exercise program where sometimes you're really at it and other times you aren't. So the practice of meditation, um, you're practicing within each individual session where you sit down and try it out, but it's also over a lifetime. So um, part of it is is having that self-compassion and not judging yourself if it's aimless. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's just what's going on. And really? a, yeah. the tool for that too have you heard of insight timer no i've not insight okay so timer. there are tons yeah yeah tons of meditation apps headspace calm whatever um i like insight timer the best i think it's the easiest to navigate and to find stuff that's really suited to you um you can search by length of time and topic and um they have lots of australian people on there for some reason or another you've got a lot of folks <laughs> in your realm that is teaching meditation Oh, really interesting. Um, I might have to give it a check out and that's something we'll definitely link to the show notes too so that our audience can go and have a look. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us and your meditation practices as well. Now we're moving on to the open mic and this is your chance to talk about anything that you're passionate about and it doesn't have to be related to the topic. So the floor is yours. Please take it away. Okay. <laughs> um, so I think I think in this context, what I'm passionate passionate about is helping people, individuals who look like they have it all together. Um, their lives look great on paper and their Facebook pages look seamless, you know, whatever it is, maybe even their friends and family think, damn, they got it going on. They got the partner and the job and they're healthy. Um, and yet these folks uh, still on the inside feel a lot of, of pain. Often there's a lot of shame. Uh, a lot of questioning, feeling not enough, um, feeling disconnected from friends and family and partners and then themselves. And I have the privilege of knowing all that because it comes out in our therapy. But um, I just really like to shine a light on the fact that even if you have, you know, money is another big one. Oh, so-and-so has got tons of money. They must be fine. And the external tickets to happiness or whatever don't actually get reflected internally and uh and i like to support those people and invite others to have compassion that's a really good um i feel like that's a that's such a valiant effort from you and what do you think needs to be changed in that department i i guess there's an invitation to those folks to become vulnerable with where they're struggling because yeah. if you look like you have it all together and really good example of this would be um celebrities or even like i'm thinking of um robin williams right now you know mm-hmm. bless him and rest him like we have so many folks whose lives look like they're going well and then all of a sudden there's a surprise and there are a lot of reasons for that but the more that we can learn to open up communicate connect and be real about what's painful the more it can actually have a chance to heal and resolve. Um, But on the flip side, that asks of the people around us that they be kind and patient and that we all learn to listen and to hold space for one another. And um, that is not always an easy thing. We don't all have feelings wheels. And (laughs) (laughs) um, I I hope that there's a shift toward that. But I think in cancel culture too, I, I on my mind it's mm-hmm. it's hard to step forward and to be real and authentic about what's mm-hmm. going on mm-hmm. because there's a risk of um being judged or canceled yeah. or condemned yeah and so it's apparent that you have a huge hope for this is this something that you see our culture and our society being able to move towards yeah totally i mean i could have just said i'm passionate about therapy And what I mean is we're seeing in the mainstream media all over the place, like not just social media, but television shows, movies, et cetera, therapy and therapists are popping up Mm -hmm. like crazy. And I think that's a step in the right direction because it's starting to destigmatize and normalize this work and realize that almost all of us have trauma and have stuff that needs resolving. And it's not that we're broken. We're not sick. Um, there's nothing wrong with that with us. We just need a different kind of support um, that does seem to be more available nowadays, which is a great thing. 
Thank you for so much for sharing that with us, Tessa. And thank you for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Um, before we end this episode, if our listeners want to keep up with you or find your work online, where should they go? Yeah, so it's talkwithtessa.com. You can find me at, at Talk with Tessa on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn as well. All right, amazing. We'll link those in the show notes along with all the tools and resources that you shared with us. Thank you everyone for tuning in and we hope you found anything this episode at all to be useful. We'll catch you in the next one. You've been listening to Veloscope, the Relationship Science Insights podcast produced by LMSL, the Live Management Science Labs. For more episodes like this, from 10 different life management perspectives, search LMSL on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, so you can get updated on everything we have to offer. We have a wide range of topics readily available for you to check out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating our show, sharing it, and subscribing to our channel, as it helps us grow and bring you more quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website at re.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Marie Stella. Thanks for tuning in.